The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. Next, we would like to hand over to counsel for Mr. Nun Chia to put some questions to the witness. Counsel Sonarun. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. And good morning to you, Mr. Chun Li. I am Son Arun, representing Nguyen Chia. I have a few questions. It may take half an hour for this, and my colleague would also have some questions too. I have a few questions first concerning your biography. I still am doubtful as to your background as a physician. Can you tell the chamber please when you became a physician and when you became the physician, did the government send you to work in Barambong straight away? Response. I became a physician in 1967. And with the permission of the government, I was assigned to work at a civilian hospital in Badambong. Question. Until when did you leave Badambong? Response. I had worked at Badambong Hospital until 9 1973, mid-1973, and after 1970, rather in 1973, I was um, asked to join the army and worked as a military medic in hospital for O3 from 1973 until 1975. Question. After 1975, where else did you work? The President, uh, witness, please hold on. You may now proceed. Response. After 1975, I lived in Badambong until 1992 when I came to Phnom Penh and lived in Phnom Penh. Question. During the entire period of the Democratic Cambodia, you lived in Badambong. Is that correct? Response. Yes, it is. Question. Another question to you is In nineteen seventy five, this morning or yesterday, I believe that I didn't get your response correctly or I could be mistaken myself uh, having heard what you said. Uh, you indicated to the prosecutors that on the 17th of March 1975, uh, Badambong was captured by the Khmer Rouge. Is that correct? 
The president. Uh, witness, please pause before you proceed to respond. You may now proceed. Response. On the 17th of April 1975, having followed the broadcast by the Phnom Penh radio, the soldiers surrendered and laid down their weapons. They were defeated. Question. I would like to ask you for clarification. I would like you to recollect the events if you can do that. If not, it is fine. Badambong town was fully captured by the Khmer Rouge. On which date exactly? Response. To put it simply, it was on the 17th of April 1975, after order was rendered through the Phnom Penh radio, soldiers surrendered their arms. And as I indicated, uh, the announcement was made by General uh, Sichon and another general on this. Question. This morning, you already reiterated that the governor, Srei Sam Iet, escaped on the date when the Khmer Rouge was approaching Badambong province. Is that correct? Response. On the 17th of April, 19. 75. In the morning, there was no Khmer Rouge soldier coming to Badambong province as yet. It was very quiet. I don't know why, but there was no single member of the Khmer Rouge soldiers in a uh, scene in Badambong. But by 1 p.m., the governor drove his uh, vehicle to be boarding a helicopter where he departed for Thailand. But by 3 p.m., young Khmeru soldiers in some small groups came to the provincial town one after another. Question. General Mai Si Chon and General Lun Nun, Lun Nol's brother, announced that uh, soldiers had to lay down their weapons. Why these two generals made such announcement? Because uh, the Khmer Rouge were somehow their enemy. The President, uh, count, uh, witness, please hold down. Council for the Civil Parties, uh, you may now proceed. Council pick on Mr. President and Your Honours, I take issue with this line of questioning because uh, the question was about asking witness to speculate. Council Sonarun. Mr. President and Your Honours, indeed the question was not uh, speculative. I was asking how he learned uh, about this information. The President, uh, Council Sonarun, you are asked now to rephrase your question. Perhaps uh, it is not easy to understand and the response itself is ambiguous. Uh, so. It is better if you rephrase uh, your question so that witness can respond directly to what you would like him to respond. Council Sonarun, thank you, Mr. President. I would like now to repeat the question. In other words, Dr. Chun Lee, you 
stated before the co-prosecutors and the counsels for the civil parties already that during the 17th of April 1975, two generals, Mai Si John and Lun Nun, made an announcement uh, that the soldiers of the Khmer uh, Republic surrendered their weapons. Did you believe the information, the announcement to be true uh, that uh, you heard uh, from these two generals, or did you hear this piece of information as a rumor? Response, I heard uh, this information directly from the radio broadcast. I heard these two generals were saying that they were defeated and they accepted the defeat and they made an appeal to all soldiers of the Khmer Republic all across the country to lay down their weapons. Council, thank you. Dr. Chen Li, you already stated before the co-prosecutors that uh, for the civilian Khmer Rouge doctors, they were executed one after another from 1977. How did you know about this? Were you told or did you see this? Response. Yesterday I testified already that uh, for the military medics, those who were in the rank from major lieutenant uh, would uh, be executed first. For the civilian doctors, they would be deployed to work as doctors at district uh, offices, uh, medical offices. They used uh, the office, this, the, the district office as uh, the hospital. By the 21st of April 1975, or, uh, 1977 rather, these uh, doctors uh, were made to do farming and many of whom disappeared uh, one after another. These two individuals, Peng Kum Si and Dr. Kum San, whose names appeared on the list of dual slang prison, prisoners list, uh, disappeared uh, first. And other doctors also disappeared after they had uh, been believed to have been assigned to treat other patients. And I learned uh, about their disappearance through uh, their widows. Question. You also mentioned yesterday that Siu Heng's uh, wife uh, was the elder sister of Nguyen Chia. Is that true? The President, uh, Mr. Witness, just hold on a little bit. Court officer is now instructed uh, to assist uh, Mr. Witness to s make sure that the console is placed to the angle where the witness can actually see the red like activated on his mic uh, easily. Response. Siu Heng's Wai was not the sister of um, Nguyen Chia, but younger sister, el not elder sister, but younger sister of Nguyen Chia, but she passed away. 
last year or so. Question. You also went on to say that Nguyen Chia family was known to you and you knew uh, Nguyen Chia's family to be of a good family and you said you also treated members of his family. You went on to say that uh, if food uh, was scarce at other location, what goal village would never be short of food supplies? And that uh, you also knew Nguyen Chia's mother to be the one who provided food to pay to hospital. My question to you now is, uh, did you know Nguyen Chia very well or you only knew his family instead? Response. I may wish to correct your question. Nguyen Chia's mother was not the one who provided food to the hospital. I was saying that the person who provided food to the hospital, P1 or P2, or the person who worked as the head of the economic section of the sector, was the one who provided food to the hospitals of P1 and P2. And this person also provided food to Nguyen Chia's mother. Council Sonarun, I apologize uh, to you if I was mistaken, but I would like to continue putting a few more questions on this. You said yesterday that uh, you knew Nguyen Chia's family very well. Did you know him very well, too? Response. I have been in good relation with Mr. Nguyen Chia cousins and family members. Nguyen Chia's mother was believed to be a respected uh, woman, but I never been in contact or knew or uh, known uh, Mr. Nguyen Chia. Council, you say that you have never known Nguyen Chia or in any contact with him. But during the democratic Kampuchea regime, had you ever heard of his name? Response. During the democratic Kampuchea regime, I used to hear of him as the president of the assembly. But I just don't recollect when exactly I heard of this. Question. Mr. Doctor, apart from being the president of the assembly, did you hear of him holding any other positions? Response, no, I didn't. Question. Uh, it would be good if you keep saying that you don't know if you actually don't know when I ask you a question. The next question is that uh, you heard uh, that Mr. Nguyen Chia was the president of the assembly. 
Did you ever know that Mr. Nguyen Chia was having any authority in the government as to order any arrest of people or execute or style the population, so on and so forth? Response, I don't know. Council, thank you. Uh, question. In your book, you wrote that a man who was the former custom official officers in Badambong province who was a Nguyen Chia younger sibling, and Nguyen Chia was the brother number two, this gentleman was not taken away by the Khmer Rouge. You mentioned about brother number two, how could you dub this term? Did you improvise the terms or you heard somebody saying that? Response, I used the term brother number two because I heard from other people using this. Again, I don't remember when exactly I heard uh, people saying this when referring to Nguyen Chia. Question in your book under ERN in Khmer zero zero six seven eight seven five nine and in English uh, zero zero three six uh, nine six eight six. You said that Mr. Siu Hing rallied to the Prince Norodom Sihanouk after 1954, after the Geneva Conference. Can you confirm, please, uh, when exactly did Siu Heng join uh, the then Prince Norodom Sihanouk. It is for the record of history to be correct. Response. As to Si Heng, I knew clearly that after the Geneva Conference, he rallied to the then Prince Norodom Sihanouk to serve the Royal Army of Cambodia, and then he was uh, promoted uh, to the position of Colonel. And later on, he had health problem. He was paralyzed on one side of his body and remained uh, hospital uh, uh, treated or stay at his family home all along. Question, rather, Council, I have uh, asked you all the questions I intended to ask you. I have no further questions, but I would like to cede the floor over to my council, uh, co-counsel to proceed.
The President, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning to everyone in and around the courtroom. Um, good morning, especially to you, Dr. Hun Chun Lee. My name is Jasper Pau. I am international co-counsel for Nu and Chia, and I have um, questions for you today that follow up on questions posed by the uh, prosecutors and the civil parties and my colleague, Mr. Son Arun. I will try to be clear in my questions, but if you um, have trouble understanding the question, please uh, uh, ask for clarification. You discussed yesterday briefly um, how you came to writing this book, and you described how you, during the Khmer Rouge regime, took notes, but later um, destroyed those notes. And um, my first question is, why at the time of the Khmer Rouge regime did you take notes? Response. As an intellectual, I valued note taking. I believe that it was the very important part of my life. However, during the Khmer Rouge regime, my house was checked on several and searched on several occasions, and I was afraid that. Uh, the diary I kept uh, would be found uh, and I would be at risk. So I made the decision to have all my diary destroyed. But I did my best to store the memory in my brain instead of on the piece of paper and I tried to associate some main events uh, to make me remember the details of the events. And when, how soon after the DK regime did you start writing up your experiences? Response. I start writing this book in 2006. It took me a long time to finish this book because after 1979, everyone had to start from scratch and everyone had to make sure that we were self sustained and sufficient and I never forgot to start writing this book. I actually started to write the book in 2004 but by the time I wrote the book I was deprived of my sleep because the memories uh, made me find it difficult to have a good night's sleep because these flood of memories uh, kept haunting me during the night time uh, that I had to quit writing for some time so that I could sleep very well. But then by 2006, I was uh, determined to finish writing it. And the first edition of the book uh, was available and the second edition was uh, in 2010. So it was 2004, the first moment that you put your experiences down on paper? Mm. 
Mark, help me. Yes, uh, that is correct. I started in 2004, but uh, when I first uh, started writing, I was um, I couldn't get to sleep uh, at night. I had to uh, pause for about a few months, and then I started it again. But then again, I could not uh, get to sleep at night uh, because of the vivid memory of the past. And uh, then it was until 2006 I was determined to finish this book. The book is full of very specific dates and very um, specific events. And I was wondering if you used any um, other sources in writing this book, for example, history books or newspaper articles, to refresh your memory as to dates of important events. In writing this book, was my personal uh, brief, and it was a reflection of my memory. I did not rely on any references, even though I cited uh, certain events concerning the uh, rally of uh, Siu Heng with the then Prince Norodom Senu following the Geneva Convention in, 19, in 1954. But uh, other than this, uh, I only reflected upon my experience that I have come across uh, during the period. Have you read history books or articles that relate to the DK regime? Mark. Yes, I have. In 1980, then in 1990, and the following dates, uh, I read uh, many history books. Do you remember names of titles of these history books? I recall some of them. For example, a book written by a French, a female French writer who was uh, the wife of Sikun in French, Eau de la Dichelle. I read it uh, in the 1980s. Then I read a book written by some Dai Nerodam uh, Senu entitled The Prisoner of Khmer Rouge. And have you read books in English on the topic? President, uh, please hold on, witness. Uh, the mic is not yet activated. Suppose that response. The book that I read uh, was in French. Maybe I was not clear. I, I was not speaking about this specific book. I was asking more in general. Have you read history books or articles in English on the era? I have, li I have uh, simply seen those historic, historic books, uh, history books, but uh, I uh, did not finish the reading. Um, earlier this morning, when my colleague, Mr. Sonarun, was asking questions. You, 
you mentioned that you did not uh, remember when you had heard uh, the name brother number two. Is it possible that you heard that name for the first time after 1979? I do not recall. You are uh, a doctor, an educated man, and um, you took notes because you valued note taking as an intellectual. Is it fair to say that you wanted to take notes to make sure that your memories were accurate? Or the notes of your memories were accurate, rather? some could you please uh, repeat your question? Certainly. You stated earlier that you valued note-taking as an intellectual. Am I correct in assuming that you uh, wanted to take notes to make sure that your memories were accurately stored for a later time, accurately, accurately reflected in those notes? But yes, that is correct. But as for brother number two in particular, I did not take note uh, of it. I did not know when I first heard uh, of this, and I did not take note, and so I do not recall it now either. I um, I understand that. Um. I have heard you say that you wrote the book based on your own recollections and that you did not um, look into outside sources when writing. Is it possible that while writing this book, your memory was influenced in one way or the other by the literature you had read on the Khmer Rouge in starting in 1980 then continuing after 1990 and um, you mentioned some specific books like Au-delà du ciel and uh, Prisoner of the Khmer Rouge there may have been others do you think it's possible that your memory has been influenced by reading those books But here. No, absolutely, absolutely not. Uh, those uh, books I have read uh, had nothing to do with my writing, and so I was not influenced by them. Thank you. I may get back to this point at a later point, but for now I want to move on to uh, a next topic and um, that relates to your experiences surrounding the evacuation of um, Batambang and um, I want to start a little bit before that, before April 1975 and you were working in a military hospital. Did you ever treat um, Khmer Rouge soldiers that had been brought in to your hospital for treatment, Khmer Rouge soldiers that had been wounded during 
the battle with Lano. During the period with which I worked at the military hospital, we did not receive uh, the wounded uh, Khmer Rouge soldiers in the hospital. Did you ever hear that? Did you ever hear it being said that most Khmer Rouge soldiers were executed after they were captured by the Lon Nol soldiers, whether or not they were wounded? No, I did, I did not hear about that. And when we then move to the experiences in Batambang um, surrounding the um, alleged transfer of um, Lon Nol soldiers in buses, you have stated, um, and you were talking about the 19th of April, um, and the reference number is in English zero uh, zero three six nine six eight two, and Khmer is zero zero six seven eight seven five eight. Uh, it is a reference from your book, and I will read out the relevant excerpt. On the same day, following orders from the upper level. Military officers from the grade of first lieutenant were gathering at a Chinese school in the, in the town, while rank-and-file soldiers were gathering at So Hu Primary School near the new concrete bridge. Those soldiers came by themselves without weapons and stayed all day and night in the school buildings. My first question is, did you personally witness this? Did you see this event taking place? As for the gathering of soldiers and senior soldiers at that school, I testified yesterday I witnessed it by myself. Not only did I witness it, but I also went there to visit the military uh, commanders who were assembled at uh, a, Chinese, uh, a Chinese school in the middle of the town. And in this passage, you state that this was conducted following orders from the upper level. And I know you testified on this issue yesterday as well. I just want to get this issue clear. How do you know that this incident happened following orders from the upper level? In the Khmer Rouge regime, everything was kept in utmost secrecy. Matters were handled by the senior leaders at the upper level. This was a general knowledge of others uh, that they refer uh, to those people up in the hierarchy as the upper authority and I do not know uh, who were in the categories of uh, upper level. I only heard and I was also uh, afraid or frightened by 
those uh, in the upper level position. You mentioned that secrecy was paramount. So did you know at which level this incident had been ordered? Uh, and so I would like to uh, dwell on this a little bit on the 17 there were a few members of troops who uh, came to Bat Bong city and After dawn, those soldier, soldiers were very violent and rather offensive. They were dry, uh, riding on motorbike around, uh, showing off with guns. And then uh, the next morning, they went to a place uh, by the name of Anlongville. It was some five kilometers away from the provincial hall. They went there to receive uh, the leaders of the Khmer Rouge. And among those in the leaders, the high profile one, or the one that uh, was known uh, to the people in Bat Bong, was Mr. Kai Pine. I mentioned this yesterday. And he was the former uh, professor in the university in various provinces across Cambodia. And then uh, after his visit, uh, there were several directives uh, handed down. It was not actually in the form of writing uh, written uh, directives, but it was an oral uh, directives. And at that time, uh, we only knew that there were uh, leaders of the Khmer Rouge, but as to where they stay, what they ate, we did not know. No, we were down below, did not know about this. Where, where are you at that meeting? several kilometers outside of Batamang town. The meeting was not held in the provincial town, but there was a provincial delegation going to receive the leaders of the Khmer Rouge and accompany them to the provincial hall. Were you personally in attendance at that meeting? No, I was not there, but my boss, my boss with the rank of colonel, uh, he was the director of the hospital. He was in attendance. And did you personally hear or see any of these directives that were handed down relating to uh, the incident with the Lonnol soldiers? Or are you basing your statement on what you have heard from other people. Could you please uh, um, repeat your question? Just now you spoke about directives being passed down that related to this incident with the Lon Nol soldiers. My question to you is, did you personally hear Khmer Rouge soldiers passing down those directives, or did you see these directives in writing? Or, on the other hand, are you basing your knowledge on what you have heard from other people?
During the Khmer Rouge regimes, they uh, did not communicate in writing that much. They did not use the papers. Normally, the directive was issued orally, but uh, the overall directive was very effective. But as for the soldiers who were summoned to assemble, uh, I did not hear the directive ordering them to assemble, but I did see uh, the uh, commanders of uh, soldiers assemble somewhere in the uh, Chinese uh, school and the other assemble in the other school. But as whether I uh, heard uh, the directives or I saw uh, it in written format, I did not. So would it be fair to say that considering that you did not personally hear the directive and considering that you did not see the directive written down, you are merely assuming or concluding that there was such a directive? Yum. I want to look at the implementation. I, I, I understand you want to look at the implementation. That is what you uh, have witnessed or uh, think you have witnessed. I want to ask you questions about what you actually knew at the time. You have stated that you saw these soldiers gathered. Do you know, let me rephrase that, is it fair to say that based on what you saw, in that building, you concluded that there was an overall directive relating to this issue? The soldiers who assembled in the two different places came to those places by the orders from their uh, superior from their upper authority. I cannot elaborate any further. I will leave this issue for now. I think it is clear. You have stated also that um, the soldiers were taken away in um, five truckloads of officers. Did you personally see those five trucks on that day? Yes, I did. Huh? Rather, uh, I did not. I did not see uh, those uh, five load trucks uh, by myself, but I heard from others later on that those uh, five uh, truck loads uh, carried uh, the officers and uh, those who were well-known uh, in Battambong uh, province and those who were the commanders uh, of armies in Battambong uh, province uh, toward Phnom Penh. And on that very morning at the uh, Chinese uh, school where uh, the uh, soldier or officers assembled uh, were empty. I did not see any of them uh, mingling around that area anymore because they had already been transported away. So, indeed, you were told by other people that there were five trucks that had taken these officers away. Yes, that's correct.
a more general question that relates to this topic. During the Khmer Rouge regime, did you ever personally witness an execution? Did you see an execution? I never witnessed the execution of people. So I don't want to ask the obvious, but I have to. You did not witness the execution of these Lonno soldiers, is that correct? Yes, it is. I will move on to a related topic, and um, you made mention today of um, a specific location in Batabang City uh, that had been set apart for ethnic Vietnamese during the Lon Nol regime. Do you know why the Lon Nol authorities had created a special camp for the ethnic Vietnamese? I knew that uh, Lonnell administration did not trust the Vietnamese and uh, they were afraid uh, that the Vietnamese uh, would um, spy in order to get information uh, for Viet Cong. That's why there was an order uh, that Vietnamese uh, were uh, gathered in the, a special camp. Uh, but this um, uh, rounding up of Vietnamese uh, were carried out uh, at night. Uh, we only uh, saw them uh, gathered in these camps uh, at night. And do you know anything, did you hear anything about how these Vietnamese were gathered at night? Did people speak about that at the time? Response. I yes, I did, and I saw this because the location was not far from the hospital. I walked there and saw it. Could you tell us what those conditions were? President, uh, Mr. Witness, could you please hold on? International Co Prosecutor, you may not proceed. Your Honours, our objection is uh, as to relevance. We heard my learned friend object yesterday uh, vigorously on the basis of the scope of trial. Um, he is now uh, entering into uh, alleged policies of the Lon Nol government uh, preceding 1975. Um, those issues are in our submission beyond the scope of this trial um, and whilst perhaps contextual questions uh, might be relevant, uh, entering into specific instances uh, clearly goes beyond the scope of this trial. Thank you. Um, I can only agree with the prosecutor that there should be specific questions about specific instances and this is a very specific instance. There's a camp that was apparently set up by the Vietnamese uh, by the Lon Nol government, excuse me, to um, keep the Vietnamese contained. Why is it relevant? Contextual, indeed. Apparently, also before the Khmer Rouge came uh, to power, there were issues surrounding the Vietnamese. Is it necessarily and directly exculpatory? No. 
does it provide a relevance of uh, does it provide a history of uh, racial strife and tensions yes it provides a context if we look at Tadic if we look at Akiyesu these questions should be addressed but time is short and I uh, have no um, possibility to go into this issue much deeper for the moment anyway so uh, with your permission I will uh, move on and that next the president uh, thank you counsel indeed it is also now appropriate time for land adjournment uh, the chamber will adjourn until 1.30 p.m. Court officer is now instructed to assist uh, the witness during this adjournment and have him return to the courtroom by 1.30 p.m. Counsel, you may now proceed. And our client, uh, Mr. Nuncia, suffers from a headache, back pain, and lack of concentration, and would like to spend this afternoon in the holding cell, and we have prepared the waiver. The President, the Chamber notes the request uh, of Mr. Nunchi through his counsel, in which he asked that he be excused and be allowed to retire from the courtroom to observe the proceedings from his holding cell due to his health concerns. This request is made uh, with some proper justification, and that therefore the chamber grants it. Mr. Nunchi is now allowed to observe the proceedings from his holding cell for the remainder of the day. Mr. Nunchi has made it very clear that he has waived his right to be present in the courtroom, or to be present in the courtroom. And the chamber would like counsels for Mr. Nunchi to produce the waiver given some print or signed by Mr. Nunchi in due course. AV booth officers are now instructed to ensure that the holding cell of Mr. Nunchi is well connected to the audiovisual link so that he can observe the proceedings for the remainder of the day. Security personnel are now instructed to bring Mr. Kilsumpon and Nunchi to their respective holding cell and that Mr. Kilsumpon is to be returned to the courtroom by 1.30 p.m to the courtroom. The court is now adjourned. Some change, Rochelle.